Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go over quickly uh, about a couple of other uh, slicing um, programs that we have. Uh, Replicator G and uh, MakerWare. So these um, these are the two um, this is how they look like. Okay, so this is uh, Replicator G version uh, 40, and this is uh, MakerWare. You can see that uh, the GUI, the interface, is a uh, very uh, different, uh, very, uh, this is um, much uh, nicer looking, of course. This is more uh, standard basic uh, looking. Um, I should say uh, Replicator G uh, started way back with the RepRap project and the interface has uh, not improved a lot since. Basically it's the same interface uh, it has uh, always had. Um, Replicator G, uh, what it is, is just a graphical user interface that uh, calls on a Python um, slicing engine called uh, Skinforge, uh, which is uh, basically the, the god, uh, father or mother, whatever you want to call it, of all the slicing engines that uh, we have today. And uh, basically, all, all, it's what all of the, the RepRap project was based on this uh, software for control. So I'm going to go up about a little bit about the over the basics of, of uh, Replicator G, where to get it, and what are the differences between one and another. Uh, Replicator G, where can you get it? At the Replicat, uh, Replicator G site, which is replicat.org. Um, it's open source, yes. Uh, it's free, yes. It's multi-platform, yes it is. Uh, the first pro of this uh, software, which I'm gonna show, is that it can play the Imperial March. This is uh, very important. I'm going to show you. Uh, so this is a uh, old style cupcake CNC uh, MakerBot. It's the first uh, type of MakerBot that they came up with, and this is of course a uh, accelerated uh, video of uh, the machine printing a Darth Vader head. This was back in the day when. Uh, ABS was only white and they had o only just acquired black ABS. Okay, so that's really important. Um, you can. Uh, well, the first thing I, I, is I wrote this software. <laughs> well, come again? The first thing is that I wrote that software. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> so this is um, it's just a fun example of. of uh, I show this well first because it's fun. Second because it shows you how uh, just raw how, how how basic and powerful this software uh, is. Maybe a little bit out of date at this moment, but. It's uh, very nice because you can actually edit uh, and visualize G-code in it. I showed you yesterday and I can show you here again. Uh, what you were seeing here was actually um, a G-code uh, to, sorry, a MIDI to G-code uh, piece of software that, uh, that was used to represent the Imperial March using, uh, they were tuning the, the, um, the notes of, the, of this uh, MIDI file to to <laughs> resonate with the movements of the in this case the Z engine, okay. So this was of course a really fun thing to do back in the day, uh, about c well, four years ago, and uh, people would get together with uh, lots of makerbots and produce an orchestra of makerbots, and this was uh, just very very geeky thing to do. Um, but anyway, I say that because uh, yes, I mean it's it's very very hacker friendly uh, piece of software. One of the nicest things it has, and uh, of course this was of then exported to all of the other frameworks that we're gonna, uh, sorry, software that we're gonna talk about today, it has a nice uh, control panel. I don't have access to it now uh, because I'm not connected to the to the machine, uh, but 
you can control manually uh, basically uh, three pieces of, of uh, core uh, pieces of the machine uh, movement of the um, of the um, extruder uh, of course temperature of the bed and of the um, and of the extruder itself and also the, the the movement of the of the motor so it's it's quite nice when you have like a, a, a jam on your machine and you want to uh, get the machine unstuck you can use a control panel and and, and do it through here uh, this is of course now available in all the other software that we are going to see today uh, it's actually missing on makerware which is uh, for me it's a very big disappointment but it's the way these people have decided to go with their software to try to keep it uh, very controlled, very tightly controlled so people won't go about and mess up uh, the machine because I should say that if I go here and edit the, the G code and put some random crazy numbers like for the temperature um, I'm not sure if how it is. I think uh, a warning jumps up saying that you're using a, 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 a not very uh, safe temperature, but you may know this warning because you're in a hurry or something. So you could actually damage uh, the machine if, if, if one of the, the safe fail, uh, fail, fail safe switches uh, don't activate. So in that sense, you know, it's um, a pro or a con, depends on, on how you look at it. Okay. Um, it's got live temperature readings when you're printing, which is also a, a, a very nice feature. Here, I, again, you don't see it here because I'm not connected, but here in the upper right hand corner you could see the temperature of the platform and of the extruder. So that's a nice feature. Again, also missing on, on the MakerWare um, uh, software, which is also uh, a pity. Um, I guess they, they might um, add that later. Um, G code editor already talked about that. Hacker maker friendly because of what I've already uh, talked about. It can also be used with various uh, types of machine. If I go up here, I can choose, you know, a plethora of, of 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 different machines. Not only MakerBot machines, but other uh, bots as well. Um, you can see here the the Ultimaker, the um, you know different types of uh, of rep wraps, and of course various types of their own uh, machines. This software was uh, initially um, um, one of the uh, core members of the team that developed this software was uh, is uh, uh, Zach uh, Smith, former member of, of, of Makerbot. Um, so you know it's, it's no surprise that uh, a lot of the support is, is, is given to, to these machines, to their brand. Um, what else? Um, you can also use other slicing engines. You can go up here and then you can choose your, your slicing engine. Uh, you know, it's, you, can, you can use, uh, I'm going to show you what, what other uh, engines you can, you can call upon now. I, I rarely use this anymore. Uh, also, it, can, it has a nice uh, feature that you can roughly estimate the time that you're going to take to print a piece. Like, for example, I use this, um, this, this machine, this, this, sorry, this piece, this skull. Okay, and uh, you can see here some stats, which are nice uh, for, um, it says, uh, well, how much it took doing each thing, but uh, at the end, what I like to see is this. It's that it took uh, seven minutes and 22 seconds to export this file. And I should say that uh, the biggest uh, con of this uh, software is that it's very, very, very slow. Uh, of course, back in the day, it was the only option you had for for software, so you know you couldn't really uh, compare to any of the uh, to any other software because there wasn't any other software available. But right now, I mean, um, today it's just too slow compared to other software. Still, it does handle some things a lot better than other softwares. I should say that this is only the GUI because it, at the end it only calls on Skinforge. Skinforge can be called; it's a slicing engine that can be called from uh, also I think from CUDA and Slicer. So you know, it's not only for, for Replicator G. Um, it uh, also had a feature that they doesn't work too, much, too well with uh, accelerated print, which is a, a calculator of cost uh, in money, uh, what, it, what it cost the, the, the piece to make, which uh, I found very, very useful to illustrate to people how much the pieces would cost. It would just roughly calculate the volume, uh, the extruder volume uh, of material it was going to use, and depending on what the material would cost in, in you know, dollars per, per kilo, it would tell you how much the pieces was going to cost, and actually it would also tell you how much money it was going to cost to power the machine during the time it, it, it took to print. 
So it was a nice feature to see, you know, you, you would say, for example, $2, the, your piece would cost $2, but from those $2, maybe $1.80 uh, $1 was uh, used to power the machine, the other 20 cents was uh, for, for um, for a material, which to me was always kind of nice to see how uh, always for these machines it may, it costs you more money to have the machine running than it costs uh, to actually uh, print, you know, uh, material-wise. Okay, another nice thing, another uh, um, nice thing about this software is that uh, it, it calculates support structure, support scaffolding, um, really nice. Uh, it's got a couple of options for calculating interior or full supports. Interior is when it's when the support is within uh, a piece and exterior and, and sorry yeah full support is when it is exterior and interior and um, interior support and sorry exterior support is only for exterior part. We'll, we'll see an example of that later. Also it's got uh, since it calls on SkinForge it's got, you can also um, edit uh, settings for SkinForge. I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, it's not I, it's just very you know very intuitive here in, in the menu, and uh, what uh, I can edit I can duplicate a default, make my own default depending on on, on on my own settings, and so I can just duplicate one, an existing one and then um, you know I'll do a test here, and then I can just uh, tweak about the settings the the skin for settings we have seen this uh, window before, I think Alessandro showed it this morning, and this is all the options that you have from SkinForge. This is just in, um, very uh, lots, lots uh, of options that, uh, like Alessandro was saying, we never know what they mean or how they're going to relate physically to the printed object itself. So it's not very uh, friendly, but if you know what all these mean and what they do, there is, an, of course, a nice uh, cheat sheet that tells you what uh, this is. Giving a machine gun to a guy that has a, a, a lot of uh, <coughs> bullets, switches, and just throwing away the, the, all, all the bullets, uh, <laughs> battles with a gun machine. Pretty because much. There are some places that are really full of. Yeah, I mean, some. Spreader, I mean, no. The names are crazy. Even even uh, really simple uh, stuff can can uh, like this is like uh, an example like if I want to make a um, um, sorry if I want to multiply uh, objects if I want to make um, to print uh, uh, various objects in the same uh, bed you know it's not intuitive where you have to go but actually this option is multiply and here you act to click on activate multiply and, and here I can uh, tell it how I want my matrix to be formed how many cells and uh, you know columns and rows sorry how many columns and rows I want to be so if, if I want to make a 4x4 four four matrix or 3x3 three three or 3x2 three whatever you know I can do it um, from here again back in the day this was just uh, you know very very nice uh, features that you, that, you, that you could do right now with the software that we have nowadays you know this is you know old school pretty much but uh, you know here are things that you know that you know absolutely don't make much sense if you don't know exactly what it is that is doing the skirt the smooth the you know whatever I'm not, I'm not gonna go into detail but here you can pretty much uh, choose, you know, the. It can also be used to tweak. Uh, since Gico can be used for for many other CNC types of machines, you know, it can be used for other types of machines. So anyway, I won't go into that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, okay, so the cons, being basically that it's really slow and that the GUI is not very nice. But people actually f that are um, familiar with processing or Arduino um, environments will find it, you know, very familiar. So it won't be uh, actually a con for them. It will actually be a nice uh, thing. So I'm going to show you quickly how to uh, slice an object here. Um, okay. Um, so I have a, an object here already there, but I can just come uh, here to my list of uh, STLs. And I can just drag and drop, which is quite nice. Uh, of course, it's, you know, let me hold on one second. Let me choose whatever else. Uh, don't save. OK. So I'm going to choose the skull. I'll drag and drop it here. OK, so it's no problem. And then I'm going to go uh, just, you know, basic settings, center, put on platform. I can move it about. Yeah. Um, 
I can lock the height so I don't move it outside of the platform surface. I can just do some basic um, view, change of view here. Of course, I can rotate it, uh, you know, be, uh, make it uh, the lay flat option is not the greatest. Sometimes it does some crazy stuff when the, an object doesn't have a, a very well defined flat surface, it does some crazy things. I can rotate around Z, which is nice, so I don't go and do something accidental like this and uh, lose my, my, my flat side. Um, so, um, okay, view, move, I uh, already saw that, rotate, mirror, which is, yeah, you know, I can reflect the, the shape in, uh, the, sorry, the, the piece on whatever uh, axis I want. Uh, I can scale, um, I can do this, uh, of course, this was, I think, so most of the core uh, members of the team were uh, from the US, so they like to work in inches, don't ask me why, but uh, you know, you have a nice uh, feature to translate inches to millimeters if you don't know what, how to translate that, which I'm um, pretty much sure everybody knows how to anyway. Uh, of course, scale factors, you know, 1.2 for, uh, or 1.5 or whatever, um, so anyway. Um, and then, of course, uh, the only th one thing that is not uh, so nice about this is that you can't really, uh, the scale can only be do done um, uniformly, so I can't pull on uh, each axis individually, which can be done in all of the other software. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and, and, do, and generate the G code. It's asking me to save, because if I have done some changes, of course, I do want to save those. And I'm going to generate the code. Asks here about the profile that I'm going to use. I'm going to choose a uh, replicator slicing defaults, because that's what I'm going to use for, for the MakeAware example, so it, it has the same um, settings, yes. I can choose either of the extruders to work on. I can uh, um, choose to use raft or support. Raft is when we have the first layer, it makes a nice raft so the piece sticks well um, to the, the raft sticks well into the surface, the piece sticks well into the raft. Uh, of course, I, if this is, this has, says raft or support because I'm going, if I'm going to use support material, I have to have this clicked, okay? And this is where I was telling, uh, talking about the support. I can have either exterior only support or full support. So if I have a, a shape that has, is very intricate and has, needs uh, interior support, I would choose full support. If I only need exterior support, well, of course, exterior support. Um, the thing with support is that support comes from uh, the bottom of the piece, always from the platform, yes, and all the way upwards. So support, you know, is usually a lot of volume, a lot of uh, material extruded, so it takes a lot of time when, when you're going to print. Um, uh, support takes up a lot of the time of, of the print itself, so you know you have to wisely choose whether or not you want the exterior or the full support. Um, this is just basic or, or uh, um, expert uh, to call it somehow uh, op uh, options. Um, so here are the basic settings about infill, layer height, number of shells, feed rate, travel feed rate, print temperature. All of these uh, settings are common to pretty much all of these uh, software. These are the basic settings that you would expect to have in, a, in, a, in this type of software. Infill is how much percent uh, you want to have inside of the structure or said in another way, how you want the, the, um, the software to handle what is considered to be a solid. I can go uh, as low as 0% and make a hollow object or I can go as high as 100% and make a 100% solid object. Of course, the more um, infill we use, the higher we go in infill, the slower the print is going to go. And of course, the harder the, the piece is going to be. Alessandro mentioned a number uh, this morning, I think it was around 20 or 30% that is more or less considered to be already a solid object. More than that, it's just a wasted time and a waste of, of material, of course. So when you're trying, to, when you're, uh, when, since we're prototyping, we usually want to go, since you never get, or you almost never get the, the print right at the first time, you always want to use a very low infill uh, as your first uh, print. Uh, two, three, five percent is a good number, so you have some kind of, um, structure inside the piece so the piece doesn't collapse if it's too heavy or too big. 
Yep, so 5% is a good number for prototyping. Once you get you, you, if you want a finished piece, you can go as high as 15 or maybe 20%. Higher than that is just, you know, again, a waste of time. Um, Thank you. There is also. From 0% to 40%, all the various infields and various patterns that you can choose. So you can have a look afterwards, it will be here. Thank you, Gaia. Yes, like uh, Gaia was saying, you can choose also the, but not only how much per, uh, infill you want to have, but also the shape of the infill. Okay? Um, and just another thing, by the way, this is made of a 5% infill, and you can try and bend it and see if you manage to. Because you can, it's really sturdy, even with a 5% infill. So have a look at it. And yeah, please uh, pass it around later on. Uh, so we did uh, write some of the information of the pieces that are on the shelf on some. Um, 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 we tried. We just just try. Uh, it's a also this is also a, it's a good idea when you're when you're prototyping and when you're uh, producing your pieces. Try to record or write down at least in a piece of paper what type of settings you did for each piece, so you can see what changes what 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 changes here in, in these numerical values. How does it affect in reality, in your physical uh, piece, how, how it's going to actually change? Because at the end of the day, uh, that's what we're going to uh, uh, affect, you know? Because then you might see that using 10% uh, or 15% or 20% or 30% are pretty much all the same to you, so you're going to stick with the lowest number possible so you'll have faster prints. Um, the, okay, the number of shells is how many uh, extra perimeters you want or how many, this word has been um, used in various terms. We've used uh, loops, we use perimeters and we use shells all to define the same thing. Pretty much the shell is whatever touches, whatever part of the piece touches the, the atmosphere, okay? So the shell is always the outermost part piece of, of your piece. and. Uh, Number of shells in the case of, of, of Replicator G and Skinforge, it means uh, how many additional uh, walls you want to have for the object to have beside, of course, the, 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 the most uh, outermost um, part. Yes, so I can go one, two, three, or, or as many as I want. Like Alessandro was saying, if I have an object that has very intricate uh, shapes, if I add a lot of, of, of shells to this, a lot of walls to this, I might start to lose some uh, features. And the number of shells you go higher only when you want to have a more uh, sturdy object. For example, if I want to embed uh, a, a nut, like for example an hexagonal nut on a piece that is going to be subjected to a lot of torque or to a lot of force, I do want to have a lot of shells on, on that so that my, my piece will not uh, break and will not break so easily. Okay, and then uh, feed rate is uh, pretty much how fast uh, the printer is going to, uh, to print, uh, obviously. This is the given in millimeters per, per, per second. And higher feed rates, of course, uh, mean uh, lower um, um, extruding, uh, sorry, printing times, but also mean that you know, the machine is pushed a little bit to its limit. So you want to keep this number in a safe, uh, in a safe uh, window. And it actually, if, you, if I hover here for a little bit, I can see here, uh, hold on. It gives me, um, you know, uh, it tells me what the numbers are. At zero to twenty is low. Uh, default is from twenty to forty, and from forty and up, it's uh, it's considered fast. This was also, I think, this is outdated. Fast is now, or normal is considered to be between eighty and hundred, and over hundred is considered to be fast. All this using accelerated prints, which pretty much all of the machines are are using now. And the travel feed rate is how fast the head moves when it's not printing. Okay, so if I'm if I'm printing a hand, for example, I have um, when I'm printing the the fingers of the hand, this would be the feed rate. And when I'm moving from one finger to the other when I'm not printing, that would be the travel feed rate. Okay, so sometimes you want to play around with this number, but most generally you want to keep it a bit above the feed rate because you know we want uh, lower uh, print times basically. When we don't care about the print times so much, we can always, you know, move those numbers a little bit down 
and have a nicer quality prints. Uh, of course, we also mentioned, uh, Alessandro also mentioned this this uh, this morning. When you're going uh, the layer height, when you're uh, using very low layer heights, you want to go uh, with um, slower uh, speeds for, for feed rate and for travel feed rate. Of course, the print temperature is how, how hot you want the hot end to to be, that's going to depend largely on the type of material and uh, that you're extruding, whether it be ABS, uh, PLA, or whatever. Okay, sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll finish quick. Layer height. We talked about that. This is uh, about uh, Alessandro mentioned it this morning, so I won't go into detail. Okay. So just so you to give you a, a figure about uh, how slow this is, this piece took seven minutes to export. Okay. So keep that uh, number in your head. And I'm going to go now to MakerWare. And uh, this is Javi, so I'm going to make a new one, new file. Yep. And then I'm going to just drag and drop the same file here. And uh, OK, so let me open up my document here. And I'm just going to go over the pros and cons of MakerWare. Where to get it? It's here at the makerbot.com uh, page. It's an open source. It's not open source. That's why the sad face. Uh, it's free. It's multi-platform. Yes, it is. The um, pros. I'm going to start with the biggest con that this software has. It's the only for controlling Merkabot brand machines, which is a uh, pity because it's a really nice piece of software. But you know, it's, uh, it's their software, so who can blame them? <coughs> the, um, Pros being, it's a very nice uh, graphical user interface, very intuitive, very nice uh, to use, very user friendly. Uh, always beta, which is uh, pro, but also a con. It's very buggy software; it crashes a lot, uh, I should say. Uh, the also, it's um, well, the cons will go later. But anyway, uh, talking about the pros, it's uh, very user friendly. Always beta is also a pro because they're always improving this software. It, it, you know, it has had I don't know how many. Um, uh, improvements over the last uh, years, even over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, it does do some basic experimental mashup, which is quite nice. Uh, like, also, it is very intuitive because I can do like Control C, Control V, so I can make, uh, you know, I can arrange uh, these pieces and make a nice, um, nice uh, mesh. But actually, if I if I if I intersect these pieces like that and try to print, it will do some nice uh, mashups. They're experimental. I haven't experimented much with this, but you can also, you know, you can you can try yourselves. Uh, uh, you're encouraged to try and see what happens. Of course, it doesn't have to do with such a big things, but you know, things uh, interesting things can be can be um, done with this. Um, Multi-object capable, which so I can you know arrange a lot of um, uh, objects on my platform. I can call like for example from its own uh, library. I can call onto other boxes, uh, for example. See, and uh, also I can do like I can scale uh, without uniform scaling. So I can just pull on the on each of the axes individually, independently. Yeah. That also is also common to other softwares uh, too. Uh, well, of course, you can you can use uh, Control V, Control C, Control Z uh, options. Uh, you can go back on, on on changes you've done all the way to the original file uh, using just Control Z. It's, it allows you to use hotkeys, which uh, is also nice. Uh, you know, if I press M, it it'll, it'll go to move. If I press S, it'll go to scale. You know, so it's uh, also nice uh, for um, for moving around f uh, fast. Uh, once it, when you're prototyping, you're you're gonna end up using the software a lot. So whatever sa saves you time, you, you know, it's welcome. Um, what else? Uh, well, the hotkeys. Well, I can pan on this uh, software, which is also a nice uh, feature. Wait, sorry. When I look, you know, I can. And also, you, well, you you can get to see these machines and this software is all made in uh, Brooklyn, so you can see the skyline of New York here at the at the uh, in the, in the horizon, which is I don't know, it's nice. Um, what else? Okay, where am I? Okay, lets you do um, dual extrusion quite nicely. Very intuitive for doing uh, dual extrusion uh, prints. You can assign actually. Um, 
we can we can see that later. But I'll show you later. Uh, I don't want to load a, a dual extrusion design as it takes some time. But anyway, I can assign here uh, for each uh, each of the extruders. It doesn't show now because I'm not doing dual dual print, but it will show another extruder here. And you can assign color, which is nice. Uh, so you can know, like, if I load on one extruder blue and red, for example, I can assign it here. It doesn't do any color information added to the piece. It's just so you remember which which is which, and then when you when you do it in the in here in the software, you actually see what the how one uh, piece is going to look in one color and the other piece in the other color. When you're doing dual extrusion, you're actually tricking the machine into thinking it's doing one piece, but it's actually doing two uh, pieces just uh, put together. Um, what else it lets you do? It uh, you can use. Um, it can call on Skinforge for slicing engine, or it can use its own slicer engine. And of course, uh, since it calls on Skinforge, you know it, it, you would expect, and it does that. It lets you edit and view the settings that I showed you before on the Replicator G. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go over the cons before I do a quick example of how how it works. Like I said, it's always beta, which also a good thing. But in this case, it's also really buggy. It crashes a lot. Uh, like I said before, it uses some kind of virtual printer, uh, some emulator that you will see here. These services is, is what it's called a service. So it always has to have a, a, some virtual uh, service running in the background. And if this is not working, then the, it doesn't let you uh, uh, pretty much do anything on, uh, with the software. And this is also very buggy and it crashes when you're using another software. And so you have to keep in mind this when, when working with this. It kind of hogs the communication with the, with the serial port. So it doesn't let any other software control that. And if it's uh, another software is using that, it won't start. So you know, I have to really work on that because it doesn't work really well. And if you don't, and if you don't know that, then it can be very frustrating. If you're, for example, if I run Replicator G and uh, I'm running Replicator G and I try to run make it work, it won't let me work whatsoever. And it's not very easy, well documented. It's what well documented, but of course they don't say it right up front in the web page. Hey, if it's not working, it's probably this. You have to dig around in the forums, but you know at this point, pretty much everybody knows about this. But if it's your first time, it can be a bit frustrating. Um, it doesn't let you estimate uh, time or material or, or cost or anything, which I find very disappointing which, because a lot of other software lets you do that. I'm going to finish right away. Uh, it's hacker, maker, unfriendly because it's very basic. It doesn't let you do, to touch uh, many things and um, doesn't ver do very good support uh, calculation. And the dual material, which everybody would love to try uh, right now, but it's uh, still, not, still not available, they do have to work on that. And it's a pity because they actually sell their machines saying that they can work with multiple materials, but when you try to uh, work with that, it's still not a supported uh, option. So that's, for me, it's a, a really a put down. So anyway, uh, I'm not gonna go over the demo because we'll we'll get we'll have a chance to do that hands-on today. And if you're not gonna use the makeover machine, it's not worth uh, uh, the time for me to show that right now. But I will gladly show anybody uh, throughout the day and throughout tomorrow how to do that. And that's it.